Hey, I'm Pastor Jim, and we are here for another lunch recap. Y'all, we had a great discussion this past Sunday on this title that I want to share with you called The Missing Link. All right. Now, before we get into exactly what that is, I kind of want to start with this story right here. I want to read some things to you and kind of get into what The Missing Link is all about. This stems from uh, something that we talked about and I discussed a couple of years ago, but I think it's a very important topic, all right? So I wanna go here to Exodus chapter one, verses six through 10. And what it says is, is that now Joseph and all of his brothers and that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and they multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous. So the land was filled with them. This is talking about the Israelites. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. He, look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. Now, we all know about the story of Joseph. Joseph was somebody who was sold into slavery and then goes down to Egypt. He's able to interpret a dream from Pharaoh, and that dream is something that is able to save Egypt. And even other countries, when the famine hit, nobody had any food anywhere, but because of the preparation that Pharaoh had in Egypt had, because of Joseph interpreting that dream, everybody would come to them to be able to get their food. And so uh, Pharaoh says, okay, Joseph, I'm gonna make you the second most important man in the country. And he brought all of his brothers there. And so that's where the Israelites lived. And so anyway, after all this time, they begin to grow and grow and grow and grow. Joseph died, that original Pharaoh died and the new Pharaoh came to power who had forgotten about why the Israelites were there. And so he says, look, if they, you know, if, if there's a war that breaks out, they're gonna outnumber us. So we need to do something with them. So verse 11 tells you what they did. Verse 11 says, so they put uh, slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and they built Pithom and Ramses the store cities for Pharaoh. Verse 12 says, but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and they spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and they worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. If you want to know how the Israelites became enslaved in Egypt, this is what happened. And they were in slavery for, they say between maybe 400, 430 years. And so what happens, all right? Well, we all know what happens, but let's look at it. In the Exodus chapter three, verse one, it says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his brother-in-law the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. So what we're reading is, is that Moses goes to see why the bush is not burned up. And when he gets closer to where the bush is, it says that God calls him. And I asked, I, I was wondering, and I asked the question, well, why is it that God is calling his name? I think the reason that God was calling his name through the bush is because God was making sure that Moses knew that God, this bush, this, this thing that was on fire, knew who Moses was, it called him by name. And it's the same thing that God knows each one of us by name. And, and in John chapter 10, verse three, it says the watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So the, the name that you have, the thing that your mother and your father named you or whoever your guardian might have been that gave you your name, God knows what that name is. God did not name you, Mo, uh, name him Moses, but he knew the name of Moses. But there's also something about that name that you should know. In Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, it says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And so the Lord is telling us something about that name. Something specific that we should know about it before the name. What we read here is that before you were born, I knew you. Before you got here, before I formed you, I set you apart and I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. So what he's saying is, is that before the name, before Jeremiah was born, he was set apart and appointed as a prophet. So before he was born, the Lord knew him. Before he was formed, the Lord knew him. But also before his parents gave him a name, before his parents even knew that he was there, the Lord knew him. 
before his parents could even have a name set aside for him, the Lord had already set him apart. And before he was created, the Lord called him something else. He called him a prophet. And the same thing goes for you as well too. Before you were born, the Lord gave you a purpose for something. This is part of the greater plan that the Lord has for you. You each have a name and the Lord knows that name, but he also knew you before that name. And he also has something specific that he designed for you. Your purpose predates even your name. So let's talk more about Moses. So in Exodus chapter three, verse five, it says, the Lord said to him, do not come any closer. God said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. And then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord is telling Moses, not only do I know who you are, I know everything about you. Take off your sandals. He knew where he was standing. Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. I know what you got on, Moses. I see the things that you are wearing. The place that you are standing is holy ground. I know at this exact moment where you are, Moses. And this is what God is trying to show to us as well, too. The Lord knows everything about you. He knows where you are in life right now. He knows the things that you are going through. He knows the clothes that you are wearing. He knows the current position that you're in. All things concerning you, God knows what those things are. And he cares enough about you to even let you know that he knows these things. So what does he say in verse seven? He says, I have uh, indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. Verse 8 says, So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. God tells Moses that he has seen what is happening. He has heard them crying, and now he is concerned about it. And so verse 8 says, So I have come out. I have come down. I, have, I am the one who's going to do it. I am going to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians. God is saying that he's going to take matters into his own hands. And verse 10 says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, we've talked about this multiple times before. God said in verse 8 that he is going to do it. And in verse eight, uh, 10, excuse me, he tells Moses to do it. The Lord says, I'm going to get them out of there. I'm going to rescue them. But Moses, I need you to go because I need somebody to lead them out. And just like Moses, the same thing to us. God will do work, but there is something required of us. And that thing required of us is effort. There is a work required for all of us. John 15 and 16 says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then your father will give you whatever you ask in my name. God chose us, but he didn't just choose us. He chose us to do something. He chose us to go, which requires an action, and also to bear fruit, which requires an action. There is something that we are supposed to be doing. There is a work required, and God called us and created us, even before we were named, to do it. When God called you, he called you to do something for him. He didn't just call you to not do anything. He called you to do something for him. In Acts chapter 1, verses eight, verse 8, it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will be, you will do, you will be his witnesses. You will do something for him. When you receive the Holy Spirit, when you receive what God has for you, there is a reason you are getting it and it's to go and do something. So the question is this. How are you serving for God? God told Moses that there was a nation of people who were enslaved and God had seen what was happening to them. He heard their crying and now it is time to do something. Moses, I'm going to do the work, but I need you to go down there and get them. Just go. There are things that the Lord is calling us to do and are we doing those things as well too? You know, some of us might be trying to find the right time to walk in our purpose. Some of us might not even know exactly what that particular thing is, but the Lord is saying the same thing to us that he said to Moses. Now go, now is the time. And so if you are listening to what I'm saying, it's time to get going, all right? And many of us sometimes may be asking the question, well, how come God doesn't just do it himself? Now he said in verse eight that he'd go down and he rescued them. How come he can't bring them out and do everything else on his own? Well, you know, that's a good question. 
Why does God not uh, stop world hunger? Why does God allow suffering? Why does God allow terrible things sometimes to happen? Well, God doesn't want those things to happen. But what he did was, was that he placed certain people in position to be able to do something about it. Perhaps that's what you and I are, are here for. Our calling, the things that God has placed on us is to go and to help prevent some of these things. In other words, here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In advance. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet. God prepared in advance for us. Before we even got here, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. There's something that we are supposed to be doing because we are created to do. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God who works in you to, uh, to will and to act according to his good purpose. So the question is, is this, what has God placed in you? Well, we can see throughout the Bible, we can see many things that he's placed in people. We see that Jeremiah, again, had the gift of prophecy. Moses had the gift of leadership. We have Jethro who had the gift of uh, um, administration. We have Paul who had the gift of discernment and evangelism. We talked about Joseph a minute ago. He had the gift of prophecy among many. Joshua had the gift of leadership. Ruth had the gift of serving and mercy. And these are people just in the Bible. But you know, the question is this, what do you have? For those of you all who are listening right now, many of you may have the gift of wisdom, of teaching, of serving, of gifts, of, of administration. Many of you may have these gifts. And if you do have these gifts, the question is this, is my gift the missing link? Are you serving? Are you using that, that gift in the area where the Lord wants for you to use it? This is not just about serving in church. This is making sure that you are using your gift in the area that God wants for you to use it. Yes, we're talking about serving in church, but are you operating in those gifts? Look, I, I think I said this one on Sunday, but you know, it, it's great if you want to sing, but if singing is not part of your gifts, being part of the choir is not what God designed for you to be. You need to be using the gifts in the area that God called for you to use them. Is my gift the missing link? Is it the things that, that is missing right now? We need to make sure that if we're going to do something, we need to do the thing that God has called for us to do. Moses could have done many different things, but God called him to be a leader. And the best thing that Moses could do was to be a leader. The way that God needed Moses to be, or what he needed him to be, was a leader. The people, the Israelites who were calling out to God, who were enslaved, they needed God to act. And God said, Moses, you're going to be the one to go. So if we take that with us as well too. How many people are dependent upon us doing what God has placed in us. Because God doesn't just give away gifts just to be given. Your gift has a purpose. Your gift has a reason. And what you have is needed. So what is your gift? So we've talked about this before. When was the last time you took a gifts test? All right. If you don't know what your gifts are, it's a great time to start learning what your gifts are and how you can use those things better in the kingdom. I'm going to place uh, on the screen right now a place where you can go to take your gifts test, where you can find out the gifts that God has placed in you. You might say, well, I, I've taken the gift test, you know, years ago. Well, you're a different person today. Some gifts may have grown. Some may have changed. You know, different things, you know, can happen. But what are the, the strong things that you have in you that God put there? It's time to put those things to work. I'll finish with this. Who is the Lord going to help through us? Let's take a gift test and find out. So I hope this was a blessing. What you have in you is important. Let's not let that thing go to waste. Let's do something with it because somebody besides us is in need of you and I walking in our gifts. So until next time, if this was a blessing, uh, I'll, I'll see you later. Please share it with somebody if it's a blessing. Like I said, let's get as many people walking in our gifts as possible. Y'all take care. I'm Pastor Jeff. See y'all soon.